Captain Kent. Who are you to say what harm was done? What do I have to be? Bridge to all decks. Time for a brand new episode of Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I'm Steve Morris. And I have been waiting to do this episode with you because I know it is one of your favorites. One of my favorites, Steve. Steve. Steve (laughs) Morris. Let me tell you something about the conscience of the king. Not only is this episode one of my favorites, it is like number two on my list of all time favorite episodes. Now, everyone listening might go, wait a minute. If Conscience of the King is Scott Mance's number two favorite Star Trek episode, what is his number one? Well, (laughs) I'm not going to tell you because I'm going to wait till we cross that bridge. And it's not an episode that you're thinking unless you have already heard me talk about that episode elsewhere. And I'm sure many of you have, but regardless Conscious of the King is my second favorite episode of Star Trek of all time, but I have to say it was not always like that. When I was much, much younger, this was an episode that I kind of just did my due diligence to watch to get to the next episode in the production order, which was actually the Galileo 7. Conscious of the King was not an episode that had a lot of action. You could even argue that except for one scene – There wasn't any action. You could say that it was a very talky episode, which it is. And when you're a kid, you know, those are things that just don't grab you. So, Steve, my question for you is, how did you feel about The Conscience of the King then? And how do you feel about it now? Well, that's what's so interesting to me is because I've known for a while this is one of your favorites. And I, like maybe a lot of our listeners, went, really? Really? (laughs) <laughs> the king? Yeah, I never disliked it. It never quite fit. I think it might be one of the episodes of Star Trek that is the least like all the others. It is not just because it has minimal action, but because of the way the characters behave, because of the way it's structured. It's almost it's also almost not science fiction. But then I go, look, if Scott loves this, I <sighs> clearly have been missing things. And so I watched it really, really carefully and really thought about it. You know, I've, I've never bothered to rank all of my Star Trek episodes. Maybe that's something I should do. Um, yeah. But it, it went way, way up this time and watching it and watching it in a different way. So I think it's it become it's a very interesting show. And uh, I can't wait to hear how your opinion transformed. I can't wait to hear those things that that really struck you. Well, maybe after this conversation, it might go up even more in your book. And you you hit on two things that, that are really big reasons why I do love this episode. For one thing, it is not like any of the other episodes of the original series. And uh, our main character, our protagonist, our hero, is acting in, in, in ways that conflict with with the way he should be acting and that he has acted in other episodes. And I think that paints a picture of him that we are seeing a different side of him. We're also seeing a lot of background to Captain Kirk. The other thing, like you said, this is probably the least science fiction-y episode of the original series. And that is another thing that I love about it because the sometimes the science fiction aspect of things can date the film or TV show that you're watching, especially if the production uh, values and the production design of Star Trek uh, looks very much like it was done in the 60s. But it's the story and it's the characters that hold up. And the story, because you have this story that piggybacks off of the Shakespearean tragedies on which it references. Shakespearean tragedies that are among the greatest in literature for hundreds of years. That makes this episode timeless. And The Conscience of the King shares so many plot elements with one of Shakespeare's greatest plays, which is Hamlet. I mean, other people may differ. I personally, I think Macbeth is uh, is, is my favorite, but I do love Hamlet. You have well, it Kirk's- shares it shares a ton with Macbeth too. Absolutely, it does, yeah. especially at the beginning of it. But you have this leader, you know, Captain Kirk, it, he, it, just like Hamlet, he has a troubled conscience. He is uh, rigged with self-doubt to the point where he kind of knows the answer to, to his questions, 
but he doesn't take action. And he stages a play or lets a play happen, and that's where he gets his proof. And, you know, so many things about the conscience of the king. I, I think this is a, an overlooked and underrated episode. And regardless, Steve, of whether there's a lot of sci-fi elements to it or not, like you can't deny that the performances in this episode are just absolutely fantastic. Do you agree? Agreed. Totally agree. And wow, William Shatner, like so many episodes that we talked about so far, he just knocked it out of the park. I mean, the enemy within, he knocked it out of the park twice. <laughs> okay. And then there's Balance of Terror where he was right on point. And then upcoming episodes like Sitting on the Edge of Forever, which he was just magnificent. But he is so great in the conscience of the king. He is so dialed back and he is so on point, kind of like the way he is in Balance of Terror. But it's his co-stars. Arnold Moss and Barbara Anderson are so magnificent in this episode, especially Barbara Anderson, who displays so much range. And, you know, keep in mind, this is like the first year that she acted in broadcast television. And in just one episode of one TV series, she goes from being this like romantic lead to being a spurned lover and hell hath no fury like a woman scorned to being totally bonkers, crazy, out of her mind by the end of the episode. And this this is all in one episode. It really is amazing. I just think that I think she's fantastic. I, I think that this is certainly one of the deepest episodes because it came out on. Uh, let's see. It came out. It was uh, on NBC TV on December 8th, 1966. It was the 13th episode to air. It was also the 13th episode to be filmed. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Finally, they got the That's numbers the first right. First one. Yeah. 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 It's the first one. But. You know, so Steve, so check this out. This episode was filmed between September 13th and September 21st, 1966. It was uh, seven production days. So we went one day over schedule because they had six days. But all right, so look at the date. So if this episode filmed on September 13th. What is it about that date that makes the filming of this Star Trek episode so special? Well, I know that this one, I know the answer because Star Trek just premiered. That is exactly right, Steve. On September 13th, they started filming The Conscience of the King. So this is now five days after Star Trek premiered on September 8th, 1966. So do you realize that that gives Arnold Moss and Barbara Anderson an advantage and an edge that the other guest stars in the prior episodes did not have because- when they knew that they were going to go to Desilu Studios to film a brand new TV, TV series called Star Trek, they had the advantage of actually watching an episode, the first episode, because it was on TV. Now, the problem, Steve, is that the episode that they saw was the man trap. I also wonder, how were they feeling? How was the crew <laughs> feeling? Because the man trap just went out, as you told us a few episodes ago, it didn't get very good reviews, it you know, didn't. and so yeah. it doesn't feel that good to go in and shoot the next episode when your premiere kind of, you know, arrived with a whimper. You know, I, I bet it was a little rough on the set. You're probably watching the man trap going like, oh, what have I got myself into? Yeah. Or or maybe they're going like, oh, well, this looks kind of interesting. But regardless of, of, of what they saw with the man trap, reading this script by Barry Trivers, they must have gone like, oh, my God, this is this is an amazing script. And because this episode was filmed in 1966 and it's dealing with basically Kodos, the executioner who annihilated 4000 colonists. This is just 21 years after the end of World War II. This is just 21 years after the Holocaust. So those wounds were still very, very raw for people who were just around in 1966, especially grownups. But uh, Barry Trivers, who wrote the episode, uh, he was 59 years old, 59 when he wrote The Conscience of the King. Between 1931 and 1951, Barry Trivers wrote nearly 40 feature films, including the big broadcast of 1937 with Jack Benny and George Burns and The Flying Tigers with John Wayne. He also wrote for mm. TV. He did The Fugitive, Mannix, Love American Style, and his last writing credit was for 
the classic series Kojak. But I just think that there is so much depth to this episode. And that's why it's grown on me. Because on one hand, you've got the Shakespearean element that that uses Shakespeare as a backdrop, but in itself is a Shakespearean tragedy and mirrors certain plot points with Shakespeare's plays. But on the other hand, you're dealing with the whole, you know, Nazi war criminal, Nazis on the run. Uh, and, and that was just so fresh in the minds of, of obviously Barry Trivers, but so many people in 1966. And because the episode was filmed mostly on the Enterprise, uh, the budget uh, the cost of this episode was $184,859. So it came under the first season budget of $193,500 by $8,641. Now, on top of the performances, Steve, on top of the story itself, and of course, whenever possible, I'm going to say on top of the amazing lighting and cinematography of the legendary Jerry Finnerman, you have one of my all-time favorite music scores composed specifically for a Star Trek episode. The last couple of episodes that we did, they had used stock music from prior episodes that were done. But this episode had a brand new score composed by Joseph Mullendore. It's the one and only score he did, but you wouldn't know it because – that music was sampled in so many later episodes. Right. What do you think of this score, Steve? I think it sounds. I think it sounds great. And th- as we get into it, there are a couple of cues that I think are really interesting. So yes, I love the score. The score is just so great, it's so fitting for this episode. And uh, Bob Justman, sensing that that this was an episode that had a completely different tonal feel than any other episode of the series so far in production, you know, he he wanted to have. Uh, something special done for it. And Mullendore just brought this real Baroque feel to it. Uh, you know, there's one point later in the episode where there's actually like nothing but a but a harp. I mean, there is no other score like this score for Conscience of the King. And in the ending credits, he's not even credited as Joseph Mullendore. He's just credited as Mullendore. Like it's just his really? last name. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. <laughs> this episode is for sure. It's grown on me. I'm curious if it's grown on, on some of our listeners of enterprise incidents. The episode was directed by Gerd Oswald. He was 46 years old when he directed this episode. He fled Nazi Germany right before world war II, oh, And wow. he directed a lot of TV. He directed Perry Mason, Rawhide, the Fugitive, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and he directed a whopping 14 episodes of The Outer Limits, which is a show that mm. I'm guessing you love as much as I do. Of course, do. yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, like when you're when you're reading about how stories started and how they evolved to become the episodes that we we've seen. And this episode is definitely one that had a lot of changes along the way. And we'll get into it during our uh, play-by-play uh, in a moment. But Barry Trivers wrote this story outline on April 5th, 1966. He delivered a revised second draft teleplay on July 11th. And then here comes Gene Kuhn, his second episode. He did a final draft teleplay dated September 8th. And of course, as you know, the title of the episode, The Conscience of the King, comes from Hamlet, Act 2, Scene 2, where Hamlet plans to prove that his uncle, King Claudius, is guilty of his father's death by staging a play within the play of Hamlet. You know, I have a question for you before we go any further. Yeah. What has been your relationship to Shakespeare? Had you seen Shakespeare as a kid? When did you start learning about it? What was, you know, because that relates a lot because I watched this show really differently as an adult than I did as a kid, Mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked it because it was around the time of when I was in high school that my feeling for Conscience of the King started to change because it was in high school in 11th grade. I was a junior when I read Hamlet for the first time and I read Macbeth and I read uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and uh, King Lear. So, so, you know, when I was a kid watching this episode in syndication and, you know, knew the name Shakespeare, but I certainly could not appreciate the references, the many, many over and subtle references that this episode does. You know, it, it was a bit of a chore 
I think, in the beginning for me to read Shakespeare, just like a lot of people, I'm sure. Yeah, it's hard. But, but it wasn't until I didn't have to read it that I, I wanted to read it that, that that changed. What about you? What was your relation to Shakespeare? So I was a, I was a theater kid. So I was in plays from second, from second grade to college, to graduating college. There wasn't a year I wasn't in a play. And so the same as you, I started reading Shakespeare in, uh, well, I think I read Romeo and Juliet in ju- junior high. And mm-hmm. then I read the ones you talked about in high school. And then I'm, I was a theater major. So I majored in political science and theater. So I did lots of Shakespeare. I acted in Shakespeare. Um, I acted in a professional production of Shakespeare at one point, which is King John. It was a, when I say professional, very small professional. <laughs> I had a very small part. And, and I took a graduate course on Shakespeare when I was at Cal. And, and by the way, in no way am I an expert on Shakespeare at all. I don't mean to paint that kind of picture. But, my, <laughs> but the difference between me as an eight-year-old kid watching this show and me watching this show now and really trying to think about it. It's not just that they're doing shout outs to Shakespeare. There is a deep reverence to Shakespeare in this uh, episode. There really is. That's exactly the point. It's not like they're just referencing it and, and quoting it. Like there's such a reverence to Shakespeare. It is part of the plotting within this episode. And I think that's what makes it just, it's just so flat out brilliant because here is uh, an episode in which the teaser, they have Macbeth and then definitely for the rest of the episode, they reference uh, Hamlet in many ways, but then that you see Kirk's motives mirroring that of Hamlet himself. Like Kirk is Hamlet in this episode. Absolutely. And it's just like, that's when I just went like, you know, oh my God, this episode just is absolutely brilliant. And it took many, many views for me to wrap my head around this episode. And once once I sort of had that epiphany that Kirk was Hamlet, that's when, that's when the tide really changed for me on this episode. And I really went, oh my gosh, this episode is so great. And I have to tell you that, that as many times as I've watched it, as many times as I've certainly embraced it as a grown up and just have hailed it as, as one of uh, Star Trek's very finest episodes, Watching it to prep for this episode, I have to tell you that at one point during what my rewatch, I was taking notes and I actually got so, so emotional, so swelled up with emotion, not just because I was appreciating the brilliance of it, but because I knew that we were going to be talking about it. And we could do a deep dive on an episode like this. You know, maybe there are there are listeners here on Enterprise Incidents who weren't crazy about this episode. And again, I get it. Like you pointed out, Steve, the episode is very has really little to do with science fiction. So much that the optical effects that were done by the Westheimer Company was the lowest of any episode in the series. Wow. The visual Mm. effects in this episode cost only $3,036. Here's the thing that's also interesting is that when the coming attractions for this episode aired, Conscience of the King wound up being one of the lowest rated episodes of the first season. So much that when it came time to pick episodes to rerun during the summer, Conscience of the King was not one of them. This date, December 8th, was the only time that Conscience of the King had its network airing on NBC. Wow. So there were also a lot of interesting things going on in the world when they were shooting this episode. The first one, and this one just blows my mind, is that in West Germany, there was another TV show that premiered right after Star Trek during this week. And it is called, and I'm going to mispronounce it, it is called Rampa Truili Orion. And would you like to know what the plot of this TV show is? Please. (laughs) It is the adventures of a military crew on a faster than light spaceship traveling the galaxy. (laughs) Wow. That sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? (laughs) Apparently they knew nothing about Star Trek. They're entirely unrelated. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It it had a massive cult following and it only had seven episodes. So, So there's some, I just like, wow, there's some German Star Trek out there that came out exactly at the same time as Star Trek. Um, On September 19th, Timothy Leary formed a religion called the League for Spiritual Discovery. It is a psychedelic religion. 
The uh, Navy's first attack helicopter began operations in Vietnam. This one's a really big one. On September 20th, the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association, put out their new rating system. So the rating systems had been destroyed about five months before with the release of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, because that didn't fit into the old style Hayes Code. It had swearing, it had sexual situations. It was just off the charts. Ah. And the, uh, the MPAA was scrambling to come up with a new plan. And they had two ratings when they start, G for general audiences, M for mature. And that is the beginning of the rating system that we still have today. On the same day, we launched Surveyor 2, which was a probe of uh, heading off to the moon to make the very first soft landing on the moon from any Earth ship. Lyndon Johnson on the September 23rd signed the first national minimum wage to include, there had been minimum wages, but they didn't include everybody. And this one included everybody. And remember Surveyor 2 I mentioned uh, it got launched on the 20th? Well, on September 23rd, one of its three thrusters failed and it didn't have that soft landing on the moon, Scott. <laughs> it crash landed on the moon. Ah, it's a good thing there wasn't anybody aboard. <laughs> exactly. Um, would you like to try to catch the conscience of the king? The play is the thing. The play is the thing. And that is where we start in the teaser. And we start with a knife. Wow. A knife stabbing someone who is lying down. And an actor on stage, an older man, of course, this is Macbeth, looks at the blood on his hand, looks around, and we hear this is the first of those music cues that are just so unique. The music cue that you hear is this Baroque cue that's composed by, by Mullendore. And then we cut to Captain Kirk in the audience. Okay, now here's the thing. This is the teaser. And instead of the usual sort of fly by of the Enterprise around the planet or them beaming down, you have this first image is of this knife that is being held aloft, being ready, getting ready to stab someone. And then you see it, uh, well, you don't see it hit the body, but you see the person die in pain. And you see the person walk away with the blood on his hands. So anybody watching this might be forgiven for thinking, wait a minute, where is Star Trek? Right. And it is only when you cut to the audience and you see Dr. Tom Layton sitting there with Captain Kirk. Very well lit in the audience, by the way, which would yeah. probably be a lot darker. Um, and <laughs> there is a man standing next to him who says, Watch him. Watch Macbeth. And we see the drunk servants, because this is the, the murder at the beginning of the play of King Duncan. And Lady Macbeth asks, is he dead? And Macbeth says, Great Neptune's ocean, wash this blood clean from my hands. The first words of Macbeth are basically the entire premise of the conflict of the character of Caridian, aka Codus the Ex Executioner. Caridian, as he is now being called, has the blood on his hands. And every time he performs Macbeth, or Hamlet for that matter, he is reliving the ghosts of his past. And, and this is the thing that's interesting is you say this is Hamlet, which of course it is. And Kirk's story is Hamlet. He is Hamlet, but it's also Macbeth because mm -hmm. Caridian and his daughter are Macbeth and Lady right. Macbeth. Absolutely. And actually they switch in terms of who they represent. But those themes of these two plays go through the whole thing. And of course, how we end our teaser is this man in the audience sitting next to Kirk says, That man on the stage, I'm certain of it. That's Kodos, the executioner. And just as he says that, you cut back to Kirk, taking a closer look at the man on the stage. And as he is squinting his eyes, you hear Macbeth say the words, Block out mine eyes. As if to, I mean, that was absolutely deliberate to match the dialogue with, with that moment. And you touch on something, Steve, that, that really is the element of brilliance of this episode. So we see in hindsight that Kirk is Hamlet, but you also see that Lenore is Lady Macbeth. So you have Macbeth and Hamlet as a backdrop to an episode of Star Trek. I mean, yeah. wrap your head around that. And that is the end of the teaser. 
you know, last week we said the teaser for Miri was really short. This might be even shorter. It is a really fast te- teaser. I, it's funny you say that. I, I, I said that in my notes too. I said after Miri, we have another very short teaser. And I would say after Miri, uh, probably one of the weaker teasers by the weak tree with the weak teaser it does not hint at the incredible drama that is about to unfold it's act one and we hear that the reason that they're here is that this guy that kirk was sitting with is a scientist and he's invented some synthetic food that's going to be really important and the fact is that isn't true that's a lie do you mean to tell me you've called me three light years off my course just to accuse an actor of being codus so Kirk is upset because not only is Leighton in trouble because he lied to Kirk, but Kirk is now in trouble because he took the, the Enterprise off course to follow up on something that didn't exist. The authorities closed the book on that case years ago. Then let's reopen it. Jim, 4,000 people were butchered. Now, this is where we see, not just here, but we actually see why Leighton is so obsessed that this character might be Kodos the Executioner. He turns the other side of his face, which we have not seen so far up to this point, and it is covered with a basically a half of a mask, probably hiding some kind of horrible, horrible scar that he got on the planet Tarsus for 20 years before, may, maybe at the hands of this Kodos the Executioner himself. Well, I, I think the moment of revealing that um, wound that you know black surface on his half of his face is so dramatic because they withhold it and the moment because we hear this idea oh code is the executioner and we don't hear that much about it and then we hear the detail because the moment that Leighton turns he says I remember him that voice a bloody thing he did and this is where they get into the idea can we really be sure that he's dead because his body was burned beyond recognition? And here's the thing you mentioned earlier that this is 21 years after the world, end of World War II. Well, it's also 21 years after the death of Adolf Hitler, who supposedly killed himself on April 30th, 1945, by shooting himself. But his body and that of Eva Bronze were burned beyond recognition. It isn't just memories of World War II and of this tragedy. It is the idea of what if Adolf Adolf Hitler is alive. Right, that is, right, that, right. That, that, and, that, so, and I think that elevates, because again, as you said, the audience, all many of them survived World War II. Mm-hmm. So this idea of the evil man, the Nazis who are still out there, or even Hitler could be alive, is a really profound thought. Jim, I need your help. There were only eight or nine of us who actually saw Kodos. I was one, you're another. If he's to be exposed. He's dead. Why does Kirk shut him down so quickly? Does Kirk really believe that he's dead? Or does he does he just not want to reopen that door to a very traumatic time of his life? And like you said, a body burned beyond recognition, that's Hitler. That is absolutely Hitler. This is a not very subtle correlation of making Kodos like Hitler. I mean, granted, you know, you know, 6 million Jews alone in the Holocaust versus 4,000 colonists. But still, the fact that, that, that there was still uh, a theory that Hitler could still be alive and living out the rest of his life under an alias. And that just rang so close to home for, for this episode, for people watching this episode and hearing these words, they're going, oh, it's Hitler. It's Hitler in space. I, I think that point that you've made is what makes the show not so interesting to me as a kid and more interesting to me now. And it's something that we've started to talk about as we've been going through these episodes is to try to think based on the limited knowledge we have, who is Kirk? And the fact that he doesn't want to deal with this is very unkirk like you know, the fact that he's just like, nope, I don't want to. He's dead. That's it. You know, I'm done. And I think you are 100 percent right that there is something happened that was powerful to him. Something obviously stayed with him because when he gets back to the Enterprise, he's in the briefing room by himself and he's he's checking facts with the computer. And he's trying to find out like- Subject, former governor Codus of Tarsus IV, also known as Codus the Executioner. 
After that, background on actor Anton Caridian. And he sees that Caridian's history doesn't even begin until, until after Codus's death. So he, he starts getting intrigued. Maybe he's right. Maybe there's something to this. But it was enough. He took enough with him back to the Enterprise to want to investigate the theory further. Now, in earlier versions of the script, of the outline, Kirk witnessed all of this on Earth. And one of Crotus's first victims was Area Commander Kirk, governor of a province, James T. Kirk's father. Wow. Now, Gene Roddenberry did not want, A, he did not want to depict the future on such bleak terms by having this atrocity on Earth. And he also uh, just, you know, didn't want to, to, to make the motive more of vengeance by making it Kirk's father. Interesting. I would have. I, I probably would have gone the other way. I probably would have let it let it be Kirk's father. By the way, one of the things, one of my criticisms of this show is I don't think this story really makes sense. This backstory, this idea that this guy was the governor of a planet of eight thousand people, and he killed half of them, but only only nine people actually know what he looks like. That doesn't make. It really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, like I, I agree I think, with that. <laughs> yeah, it's just and there and there's a whole bunch of other little pieces. Like wait, 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 hold on. You know, and and of course, you know, we said before, sometimes you pick a good story and good emotion over a plot that works like a, you know, a Swiss clock. But this is enough information in particular. I think looking at the two pictures, the picture of Kodos next to the picture of Caridian and Kirk does the first unexpected thing, which is Spock says we're ready to leave. And he says, no, we're going to delay. I'm beaming back down. So he goes back down to the planet and he's at the party that Leighton told him about because they were going to invite the Caridian company of players to the party. Now, Caridian is not there. So we're about halfway through the first act. And other than that bit in the teaser where we saw Caridian in character as Macbeth, we still haven't seen Caridian, the character himself. But we do see Lenore Caridian, Lady Macbeth, and she is absolutely stunning, played by then 20-year-old Barbara Anderson. So Barbara Anderson, when she did Conscience of the King, which aired in 1966, that was the first year that she had any work produced. She was in two other shows in 1966 that aired around to take the same time as Star Trek. One was The Virginian, and the other is Jericho. She played Officer Eve Whitfield on Ironside, which mm. ran from 1967 to 1971, during which she was nominated for three Emmys for Supporting Actress in a Drama. Oh. She was on Night Gallery, Mission Impossible, and the Mission Impossible episode that she was on was called Cocaine, in which she starred with William Shatner. And she oh. was also on The Six Million Dollar Man. But her first year working, she does Star Trek, and she plays a character who just runs a gamut of emotions from being this lovely Shakespearean trained actress to, as we see later, as a scorned woman to, towards the end of the episode, just downright crazy. Right. And the range that Barbara Anderson displayed in this episode, she was only 20 years old. It's one of the first things she ever did. What an incredible talent. And I think that she just does not get enough credit for the outstanding guest starring performance she did on Star Trek. She is completely unique in the Star Trek women, I think. She is of a, comes from a, obviously a very, very different place. And the flirtation that exists between the two is it's right from the very first moment they see each other. I saw your performance tonight. May I extend my appreciation? My father will be delighted, mister. Mr. Captain James Kirk, Starship Enterprise. We're honored. She uses the royal we. There's a weird sort of, this is what we think Shakespearean actors must, must act like. They must act sort of, you know, <laughs> and having known a lot of actors, they, don't, they actually don't act like this. <laughs> it's a whole other thing. But the other thing that we find out is that Caridian's not coming. I'm sorry, Captain Kirk. He never sees anyone personally. 
And he never attends parties. An actor turning away his admirers. That's very unusual. Caridian is a most unusual man. You saw Macbeth? That was my father. I find that to be a very interesting line because Why? she knows that her father is Kodos the Executioner. She knows that he has blood on his hands. Mm -hmm. And so saying, mm -hmm. you saw Macbeth, that was my father, is a very strange thing to say. You know, for someone whose whole purpose in life is to protect her father from being revealed as Kodos the Executioner, for letting his guilt come out. And the thing that I love about the fact that he was, not, we, we haven't seen him yet, is that we certainly are hearing about him. So the fact that we are hearing so much about Kodos the Executioner and that this Caridian might actually be him. You as the viewer are building it up in your mind that this guy is the villain, that he is evil, that he killed 4,000 people. And now he's just masquerading as a Shakespearean actor. Boy, I can't wait to get a look at this guy. And when we finally see him later on, what we what we see is completely different. But it does build up the suspense. There's something about hearing a character, having a presence of a character before that character is physically there that plays with your mind. And that's one thing that this episode also does very, very well. This next moment is very, very interesting. After a little bit of small talk, he says, I'd like to see you again. You mean professionally? Not necessarily. Here's my question, Scott. Mm -hmm. What's going on with Kirk here? How much is attraction and how much is the plan? And when does that change or how does it change in the course of this episode? We're, I, we're gonna, I'm going to ask this question a lot. Okay, well, that, those are great questions because how much is attraction here? Well, I think uh, Kirk being who he is, I mean, I think there is definitely a level of attraction that he's feeling because the chemistry between not just Kirk and Lenore, but between William Shatner and Barbara Anderson is absolutely palpable. And during the wooing scenes in this episode, we are seeing Kirk at his most charming, I think, in any episode of the original series. But I think for the purposes of why he stayed behind, why he kept the Enterprise in orbit when a Spock said they were ready to leave orbit, Kirk is already in his mind that he's, he's going to investigate this. So I think there is, I would say, a 40-60 balance there, 40% attraction, 60% motive to find out more about her father. But that does flip. I think, because I've gone back and forth, because he's so charming, and they do obviously have a connection. I kind of am more on the, it is mostly investigation, almost all investigation at the very beginning. And he's using his charm the way he used his charm with Miri in the last episode. You know, he's not attracted to Miri. He needs to get stuff out of Miri. Then this next little bit of dialogue is interesting because because they start talking about leaving. But I've only just arrived. So have I. <laughs> and you hate to overstay a welcome. Exactly. And I'm thinking about this. If a woman shows up to a party and a dude that never met her before is talking about, hey, let's let's blow this popsicle stand. I think they're talking about sex. I mean, I, you know what I mean? Like that is a bold, bold move. By the way, one thing, I always found this set really weird. It's sort of kind of indoor, outdoor. It has a very, this feels very 60s in the way that like 60s America. It's one of those things that even though we're on a purple world with the purple wall in the background, it's one of those things that always pulled it out of Star Trek for me. This having a cocktail party, it feels like a 60s cocktail party. You know what I mean? Yeah. And actually, you know, talking about the cocktail party in the background, the cocktail party, you sort of hear this sort of jazzy version of the Star Trek theme song. Hmm. <laughs> okay, and that actually is how Mullendore got the job to score the entire episode because they went to him to compose music for this particular scene. And out of that came sort of his gig to score the entire episode. But the, That's so cool. you, you know, listen, I, I, I think the fact that this episode does look very different. I mean, I feel like it feels very contained because – they did not spend a whole lot of time off the, off the Enterprise, so they probably wanted to have minimal use of other sets. But I think that actually works in the episode's favor because it just gives the episode such a completely different feel. I think this next moment in, in on their walk is 
really fascinating, particularly because we've been going in production order and, and, and the analysis we've already done up to this, because she says, At the party, you were such a brash young man. And now? Now somehow different. Not a ship's captain with all those people to be strong and confident in front of. <sighs> no, you're really very dear, aren't you? In some ways, very lonely. So she's crazy pants, but she's also perceptive in a really profound way because we, you know, the naked time wasn't that long ago. Kirk literally says, you know, no braid on my shoulder. I wish I could have just this moment with everyone. I'm not responsible for everybody. He doesn't expose that to anybody. He only exposed that because he was, you know, had the disease in the naked time. And she sees that in him in the first couple of minutes. Listen, this is another another thing when I was re- doing the rewatch for for this Enterprise Incidents that I went, oh, wow, she's known him for five minutes. Yeah. And she's already being very, very perceptive that she notices how how confident he was at the party. And now that they're out, just the two of them walking around, that that she notices how lonely he is. And she just met this guy. So she's already proving herself to be very very uh, thorough and very observant and also very smart, much smarter than her years led on. Well, and this is where I go. I think in the very beginning, it was I'm investigating. And I think this line hits Kirk. Someone having someone like really expose or see a truth about yourself that you don't you don't normally expose. I think that's where he starts to go. Oh, this person is kind of special. And it's the moment's romantic and the music is building and it's the kind of moment at which people are going to kiss. And right before that happens, we see Leighton's body. And the, the sight of Leighton's body certainly kills the moment. Uh, no pun intended. It certainly uh, takes him out of the moment. And this is Tom Leighton, who was now out of the eight or nine people who were left who could identify Kodos. That is one less person because that person has died, and this is the person who was extremely driven yeah. to convince Kirk that Caridian is Kodos. What I find a little bit weird about the moment is she killed him. You know, spoiler alert, everybody. Yeah, she's yeah. the murderer. <laughs> um, so when as they're on their little stroll and having their romantic moment, she knows they're right near the body because she's the person who killed him. And I almost wonder if the that line about being the ship's captain, maybe that was her trying to distract him in order to delay the discovery of the body. You know, I'd be down with that. I mean, I, I, I would support that theory completely because like if they're out walking and she knows that they are really close by to a, yeah. a, a person that she killed before she got to the party. Cause I mean, that's the only time that she could have done it. That was clearly a move to to throw him like that, that there, he's not going to suspect that she would have anything to do with it. I mean, why would why would he? And we're back with the wife, Tom Layton's wife, who's obviously in mourning. And one thing uh, we didn't mention is that when he was talking to Lenore, that the next stop on this theater company's journey is Benicia Colony. And they're on going to get a ride on the Astral Queen. And Kirk calls up to Ahura and asks to be put through to the Astral Queen, and he asked to be put through on Scramble. Hi, Jim. Can you do me a favor? I owe you a dozen. Just ask. Don't make your pick up here. You mean strand all those actors? I'll pick them up. And if there's any trouble, it'll be my responsibility. This is the moment, Steve, where Kirk is putting his plan into motion because he's setting into motion the events that will happen moving forward and end the episode during a play. This is Kirk's moment. This is his act one, scene four, where he is saying the play's the thing where I'll catch the conscience of the king. So interesting because, and in the next moment, we're, we're back on the bridge and again, Spock's like, okay, we're ready to go. And Kirk says, I think we're due for a pickup. What kind? Personnel? Cargo? Captain, a Miss Caridian has been transported aboard ship. She requests permission to see you. And what's interesting to me is like Kirk plays this all very close to his vest. He is Mm. not sharing in a way that we've never seen in Star Trek. And yet this is exactly what Hamlet does. Hamlet doesn't tell Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He doesn't confide in Laertes or Ophelia. He plays it very close 
because it's only about him. It's about his journey. But he's doing it. He's doing it with levity because I love when Spock says to him, how'd you know this lady was coming aboard? And he just says, I'm the captain. <laughs> uh, by, by the way, Lenore's outfit. This is crazy. Like this weird fur short. This is some strange. There's some there's some amazing and bizarre costumes in, in the original series. She went through six costume changes, Barbara Anderson in this wow. episode. And she said when she was wearing that outfit, when she beamed aboard the Enterprise, she said that thing was so tight tight and so and, and it's up so high that she could not even sit down so that that is a credit once again to star trek's costume and wardrobe designer bill tice william ware tice she shows up on the bridge and their conversation is very flirty considering very. it's in front of the entire crew <laughs> and we end up at the point of i'll make a bargain with you captain what have you got to trade? Which, you know, when you're talking to a girl that you're attracted to is an interesting line. And what she has to trade is a special performance for the crew. You make it sound very interesting. Then you'll do it. The men would never forgive me if I deprive them of your performance and your presence. And the way he says it, so charm. Like, I mean, he's so friggin' charming. Like, that's why there's got to be, even at this early stage, when he's becoming more suspicious about who this Caridian is, and especially after his his friend has has died under very 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 mysterious and suspicious circumstances, I still think there is a big side of Kirk that is genuinely attracted to Lenore and genuinely cares about her, even though they're going to do the play, and that's where it, that's where he'll catch the conscience of the king. And at this moment, who walks out of the turbo lift? for her final appearance, which is all but six seconds long on the original series, that is Yeoman Janice Rand, who as she is getting off the turbo lift, she gives Lenore like a dirty, you know, sort of cat meow look of jealousy. And that's it. And that that was yeah. it. Now, this episode must have been heartbreaking like, of, of course, I mean, obviously, yes, it was very heartbreaking for Grace Lee Whitney. In fact, she even said, I remember how horrible and humiliated I felt going into that shoot with that final six second walk on, knowing that my Star Trek career was already over. Because when you look at earlier versions of the story, Ran was featured more prominently in this episode. And there's a scene coming mm. up that actually had Rand in it, but it didn't happen. When we get to it, I'll tell you what it is. But I just, after, and, and coming after such a great role in Miri, which was the episode that they shot before this, which sort of like was the pinnacle of the relationship between Kirk and Rand, that all she had was this six seconds and then that was it. I just, you know, it, it's heartbreaking because for the first time since we've been talking about Rand, and maybe it's because of all the conversations we have had about Rand and about the relationship between Rand and Kirk and speculating on, on yeah, you know, it's better that she wasn't there so Kirk could, Kirk could do all these things in the future. But what if she had stayed? What would Star Trek have been like? What would Kirk have been like if she was just on the series? And I just – Watching this episode at that moment, I felt the loss. I felt the loss of Rand, knowing that from this point forward, since we're going in production order, that this is the last conversation we're going to have about her. I felt exactly the same way, and it's because of the way we've been watching it. Because I never cared that much about Yeoman Rand. She was, you know, a step above Riley as a character that was, you know, there more than once and kind of had some good moments. And I didn't really think much about her. And now the way we've watched it, I'm like, oh, they were building this whole thing. She was as critical to the crew, if not more so than Sulu or Scotty, you know, that she had a deep emotional moments with Kirk. And it is so funny because nobody knew what Star Trek was going to be and mm -hmm. what happened mm -hmm. to you know, Grace Lee Whitney's what happens to actors. You're out, you got a little mini run on a series and then you get kicked off and that's the life of being an actor. And it really, really sucks. It's only because Star Trek becomes what it becomes that, you know, every single person that appeared on Star Trek for a few minutes and had a few lines 
went to conventions. It's such a bizarre thing that a few weeks work for Grace Lee Whitney, that's her career in a lot of ways. But I, yeah, there's definitely a moment of, I would love to visit the alternate universe and see the alternate version of Star Trek. You know, the other thing is that this episode in production order, this is the most that we've really seen Kirk have a, a love interest that was his doing. You know, in Dagger of the Mind, he was sort of under the spell of the neural neutralizer when he was out for with the Dr. Noel. And in What a Little Girl's Made Of, he absolutely used Andrea to sort of have her short circuit, you know. This is the first time that we're actually see, seeing Kirk woo someone, woo a woman, even though he has an ulterior motive. But I think this is the most, to this point, in production order that we've seen Kirk actually really care about a love interest. I, I totally agree. And the thought that just occurred to me, there's a, there's a, you know, many tropes in screenwriting. And one of the tropes is the woman having to sexualize herself in order to seduce the guy to get the information or get the thing that or distract him or whatever. And that happens in a ton of movies. And it's, you know, one of those things that I would suggest avoiding as a screenwriter. It just occurred to me, Kirk does that a lot. I don't know how many male characters are using their sexual attractiveness to get what they want out of other people they're interacting with. I, I, I I'd have to think about it, but Kirk does that a lot. And, um, and he's certainly doing it here. And I'm going to keep bouncing back and forth about how attracted he actually is to her. Um, and the act ends with Spock saying, Tennessee, a colony is eight light years off our course. And Kirk shuts him down. My memory needs refreshing, Mr. Spock. I'll ask you for it. In the meantime, follow my orders. In other words, mind your own business, Mr. Spock. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the, the thing is like, you know, you brought up a good point. In this episode, we see Kirk act so differently than any other episode. Yeah. Like, because he's basically Hamlet, he's holding his cards close to his vest. You know, we'll see him confide in Spock and McCoy to an extent, but he's still... Only under duress. He wasn't going to duress. confide. Yeah. Right, right, right. And it's only because they call him out on, yeah. his, on his actions, because his actions are putting the ship at risk. But... We are seeing Kirk act differently here than in any other episode. And I think that that the the depth of his motives and just the you know, he's so conflicted and he's so torn. You know, it just is a lot of character. This episode is just it may be uh, falling short on the action department, but not on the character department. There are many questions in my mind, too many perhaps, about the actor Caridian and his daughter personal reasons I'm almost afraid to learn the answer. This is where, again, we're speculating beyond what we know in the show, but what personal reasons? What did happen to Kirk at that time? And the more I think about it, the more I think it was pretty horrible and he has buried it. He just put it behind him and that's how he's moved forward. And, you know, we didn't use words like PTSD. We didn't, you know, have those ideas. But the more I think about it, the more I go, the only thing that could explain Kirk's behavior is trauma. Absolutely. That makes that makes great sense. And and the, the way he was basically trying to shut Dr. Layton down in the beginning. Yeah. It's not just Kirk saying, look, uh, you know, the authority said he's dead. Kirk is saying, no, I'm telling you he's dead. He doesn't want to go back and relive yeah. all that. But if his conscience gets to him and he starts to really think about it, the more he finds out about the timelines of Caridian and Kodos, and then especially after Leighton is dead, it's like, well, that's a big, big red flag. You cannot ignore that. Like he's he's progressing slower than he should. He should have come to the conclusion that he came to much, much sooner. But you could say the same thing about Hamlet. He waited. Right. He did not take action when he should have. 100% agree. But Hamlet is not Captain Kirk. That's right. what makes it so strange. <laughs> We've never, we never get to see Hamlet be a decisive man of action leader. 
you know, until maybe the very end of the play. Um, <laughs> but Kirk, that's all we've seen. And then, we, right. you know, we're back in, we're in act two, act two, and we see something that another thing that seems like totally bizarre behavior, which is he goes to Spock's station and does some research. Normally, he would ask Spock. That's why you have a crew. And we find out a little bit more information that there were nine eyewitnesses to Kodos. Again, I think that sounds doesn't sound very believable. And there are only two left. But Leighton was one of them. He's gone. And the next two are Kirk and Riley. Stop. Is that Star Service Lieutenant Kevin Riley? Affirmative. This is Star Service before it became Starfleet, <laughs> um, but that would change when uh, when Gene Kuhn really, really got uh, got his hands dirty with Star Trek, and he just happens to be serving on the Enterprise because we already saw him in his memorable performance in The Naked Time. In the earlier versions of the screenplay, it was supposed to be a character named Lieutenant Robert Dakin, but... Gene Roddenberry, who was still, even though by the time this episode was filmed, Roddenberry had stepped away from the day-to-day part of producing Star Trek. Gene Kuhn was producing the day-to-day. He was the one who did the final rewrite of Conscience of the King. But while the outline and the earlier teleplays were being developed and the story was evolving, Roddenberry was very much involved with the direction of the story. And he's the one who said, we Let's make it a character that we already know yeah. so that the audience is already vested. And that was a good move. And this character that is we're all invested in, Kirk is sending back to engineering. He came up from engineering, Captain. Well, I'm sending him back. Any explanation? He's a fine young officer. He's bound to consider this transfer a disciplinary action. And again, Kirk shuts him down. I don't wish to discuss it, Mr. Spock. Please follow my orders. Where else have you seen Kirk put Spock in his place and keep him at arm's length. It's not just testing the strains of command. It's testing the strains of their friendship. And you could see that Spock is thinking, this is really not, not like our captain here. And this is also not like my friend. We've seen Kirk stressed. And we've seen Kirk snap at people and we've seen Kirk push people, but he's pushed McCoy. He's pushed people because the ship is in danger and this is what has to happen. That is not this situation. This is a personnel matter. And he shuts Spock down. And I also think it's telling that he calls him Mr. Spock. It's very rare that he calls him Mr. Spock when they're just talking to each other. Right, that's, that's right. Very unusual behavior. And the scene that, you know, we're going to right now, which is what you just mentioned. We go find McCoy, who's drinking a little Saurian brandy. <laughs> and Spock has gone to consult McCoy. What an interesting situation. Now, that would happen again uh, in, in episodes where, well, in, the, in the, the, the next episode that I really see where Kirk is just behaving out of character and putting his command and his crew and his ship at risk to a much, much bigger effect was the episode Obsession. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's the okay. other one. Because that's another yeah. one where, where Spock goes to McCoy for advice. And he says in that episode, Doctor, I need your advice. And McCoy says, then I need a drink. <laughs> in this episode, Spock goes to McCoy for advice and he's already he's drinking. He's already got a drink. <laughs> he already has a drink. Captain is acting strangely. I'm asking if you've noticed. Negative. You know, this is the first time in a week that I've had time for a drop of the true. Here's a note I wrote down as he's continually peer pressuring Spock to take a drink. As I wrote down, I think that Synthahol is one of the biggest mistakes of the next generation. I think because it's like one more way and it's not really one of the biggest mistakes, but it's one more way of going. No, no, we've moved. We've moved past something. We don't really need to drink like we. I was like, no, you could take a drink because McCoy's just like, look, I've had a long day at work. I'm <laughs> yeah. going to have a drink. My father. Father- this race was spared the dubious benefits of alcohol. Now I know why they were conquered. <laughs> were it. they? Were they? You know, was Vulcan ever conquered? But I, just, I think McCoy was just making a joke. Making a joke. <laughs> Spock is continually pushing the point. McCoy is going, look, he's the boss. It's a lot of pressure on him. We don't know what's going on. I don't know everything that's happening. And Spock goes. It was illogical for him to bring those players aboard. And McCoy's response is illogical. Have you seen that little Juliet? Yeah. <laughs> That's quite an exciting creature. <laughs> Did it ever occur to you that he simply might like the girl? It occurred. I dismissed it. 
McCoy says, you would. <laughs> I love Spock in this scene. I mean, I love them both in this scene. But I think Spock is 100% right. Whether or not Kirk is attracted to her or not, Kirk would never change the course of the Enterprise for a girl. Like, right. Th- he would never do that. So this is Spock's first attempt to reach out to McCoy to be like, don't you think the captain's acting a little weird? This is the first attempt. Now, when Spock comes around to him a little bit later, it's a, it's a lot more serious. Much more McCoy, serious. And, and, he, and he has McCoy's ear. McCoy McCoy's like sees the light. But for now, we are now on the one and only time in Star Trek, at least in the original series, where we have seen the observation deck above the flight deck where the shuttlecraft is because Kirk is giving Lenore a tour of the Enterprise. And this scene between Kirk and Lenore, uh, I just think the chemistry between these two actors is so fantastic that whether or not Kirk had a motive, this scene is where Kirk starts to care a whole lot more about, about Lenore. Now, he still is fishing her for information because he says to her, You must have wanted to perform since the first time you saw your father act. When was that? And she's not giving him any like clear answer. In the beginning. So she, yeah, yeah, he's still using her to an extent. But I think that in this scene alone, he, he really does care about her. And I love uh, the line. Worlds may change, galaxies disintegrate, but a woman always remains a woman. You can use that for a pickup line, and I'm sure it would work in the 21st century, not just the 23rd. And her response is great, too. All this in power to Caesar of the stars. Because that's poetry, man. Like, Kirk has shown, like, he can captain this spaceship, and he can also say the coolest, most romantic things. We've established that, that this episode is leaning into Hamlet, it is leaning into Macbeth. It is also leaning into now Julius Caesar, because this is the first of a few times where Lenore refers to Kirk as Caesar. And when we get to a point much later in the episode, she even says, Caesar, beware the Ides of March. So a couple other things about this scene. The first one is I love the observation deck. I think it was a great set and I wish we had visited it again. Yeah. Second thing is shuttlecraft, Scott. What's a what's a shuttlecraft? I actually think they added that line because the next episode is Galileo 7. I think they went, let's plant the idea that there's these things called shuttlecraft because it's never <laughs> been mentioned up to this point, right? No, it's not. That's yeah. right. So I think that's really interesting. Um also going to how much does the plot really make sense? How old is Lenore? All right. I was what Steve, I got to tell you, you know, I've said before, both on camera and off camera, how much I love this episode. And while I was prepping for this, I said to myself, I know he's going to ask me how old is Lenore. I know it. <laughs> I know he's going to bring up the age difference. Now, Lenore. No, that's not why I was bringing it up, actually. That okay. is not why I was bringing it up. Well, Lenore is 19. Okay. that's okay, my, That was why I brought it up. Because if it had been 20 years since, since basically Caridian's yeah. identity was first established, that would give him that first year for him to conceive a child. And now it's 20 years later, so that child is 19. So in the episode, The Deadly Years, we hear Kirk say that he's 34 years old. So that episode uh, theoretically took place during the third year of the Enterprise's five-year mission because of the first number in the star date. I always looked at the star date and I said, whatever the first number is in the star dates is what year the Enterprise has been out in space. So if your star date is 1312.8, it's the first year. If your star date is 5739.2, you're in the fifth year. I believe this episode starts in the twos. So that would make Kirk around 32 or 33 years old compared to Lenore's 19 years old. And boy, did I just geek out with the whole star date thing, but hey, that's what I do. And yes, there is a big age difference, but it's not 
that big of an age difference. Although for the 60s, it was probably a big age difference. It might be less than the 60s. There are a lot more. It's That's true. It's frowned <laughs> upon more now. I Yeah, I actually wasn't thinking about the age difference at all. Um, it's, it's so funny. I think we, we had a discussion off camera about the different kinds of geek that you and I are. I never, <laughs> I never learned what the star dates meant ever. Like, and I know that people have spent, you know, written books on figuring it all out. Um, and it's not, not a thing that I cared about, but I love that you care about it. Like, that's, what's so great. Um, I think, <laughs> and I also think the age thing doesn't quite make sense. And, and this is not a criticism. This is just, it's hard to make it a show is if he's 32 now, then 20 years ago, he was 12. Mm -hmm. And so like who he was and how, and then if Riley is much younger than Kirk, well, because he's got to be in his early twenties, then he was like four, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. like, so, so these ages don't all work, but that's okay. That stuff, by the way, when you're writing, it's actually really hard to figure it out. Like, cause you go like, well, how many years have passed? I remember going, I, I, I wanted people to go to a baseball game, but then I realized that I had set something in the middle of summer and that it was or, or, or in, the, in the middle of winter. And I was like, oh, that the baseball season doesn't starting yet. And I had to figure out what part of season it was in order to get them to go to a baseball game or switch it to a football game. Anyway, um, <laughs> one, more, one, one more thought I had while watching this scene is like, if we're saying that Caridian is Hitler, I just kind of went, man, seducing Hitler's daughter to, to, to find her dad is like a weird, it's a weird thing to do. You know, I get it, but it's weird. I understand that. I, I see your point, especially when you say wooing Hitler's daughter, <laughs> oh man. Um, but at the yeah. same time, it's like, where does Kirk draw the line between genuinely caring about her and using her? And you're challenging me to be like, okay, well, how much does he really care about her? I think that's a valid question. But I, I just always, all these years, especially later years, got so caught up on this in this dynamic chemistry between the two of and them. And it's great. It's great. Absolutely. I have to believe that he really cared about her. We, here's the, I wrote this down. I wasn't sure when I was going to bring it up. But one of the things of Hamlet is Hamlet is, says he's mad north by northwest. And what that means is he is pretending to be crazy. That's what's happening throughout Hamlet. People think Hamlet has lost his mind. And one of the things that scholars have speculated on for years and every single director who's directs Hamlet and every single actor who plays Hamlet has to decide how crazy is he? Is he? It could be that he is. He says he's pretending to be crazy, but no, he's crazy. <laughs> or it could be that he's completely pretending to be crazy. Or it could be somewhere in between. And sometimes he is kind of crazy, and sometimes he's not. And those decisions are are really critical to any production of Hamlet. I think Kirk's feelings about Lenore are exactly that. Is that it is? We will never figure out exactly how he feels. It is just like Hamlet. Was that crazy? Did he mean that? Did he not mean that? Is he how attracted to her? Is he using her now? It's like, we're not going to know. And I actually think that's part of what makes, I think Kirk is less knowable in this episode than almost any other episode of Star Trek. And I Absolutely. think that's what makes it really interesting. I, I can, I agree with you. I mean, you know, you, you know, I could, I could try to sort of like figure out where the line is between how much he cares about, about her versus how much he he's using her. But it's a really it's really hard to figure it out. I think that's yeah. one of the good challenges about the episode. And the other thing about this observation deck, so there was a scene that was written in the screenplay for Yeoman Rand in this oh. scene. Okay. So while Kirk and Lenora are flirting, they're about to kiss, and Yeoman Rand walks in to have Kirk sign a report. Mm. So so she walks in. And she sees what's going on and she's very jealous and Kirk is a little embarrassed and she gives him the report to sign. And he says, you know, thank you, Yeoman. And he kind of kills the moment, you know, the moment's killed. And she goes, uh, she's very efficient. And uh, he says something like, and very timely. Now that was in the screenplay mm. and that was supposed to be filmed. But unfortunately that was, Production ran behind and it was never filmed. Wow. I so don't know how, they, I mean, yeah. it would have been a good scene, but it also feels so on the nose with what the, with what Grace Lee Whitney is facing in her life. You know, like I, I am literally being replaced 
by another woman. And now I have to on stage play the part of someone who feels like they're being replaced. That sounds, it sounds a little cruel to have the actor have to do that. Yeah. And, and also, you know what? I think that after the last episode, Miri, in which yeah. there was a, 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 a more overt love triangle, you know, now, now you're in that same sort of situation again yeah, to yeah. an extent. Now, there was also supposed to be, you know, the end of the episode where we're in the, uh, the ship's theater and we're mm. watching the stage play of Hammond aboard the Enterprise. Yeoman Ram was supposed to be in that scene in the audience watching the play. So here's Grace Lee Whitney, you know, she maybe like got wind of the, of the earlier versions of the script and she knew that she was going to have a bigger part. And she's basically watching, watching her scenes being deleted, watching yeah. the work that she was supposed to do go away. That's got to just be so heartbreaking. Yeah. And like I said, though, that is the life of an actor, man. I, yeah. you know, every actor I know has had, has been in that situation. Library computer. Full personal dossiers on the following names. Dr. Thomas Layton, Anton Caridian, Lieutenant Kevin Riley, and Captain James T. Kirk. We're back on the bridge, and Spock is following up the same kind of research that Kirk was doing. Check their past histories. Report any item, any past episode or experience they all have in common. And then the computer is going to go off and work on this. And what I find it, it's always funny, and it's not, this is not a criticism, but it's always funny the things that people predict about future technology and don't predict about future technology. So we're on this ship that's out in space, we, uh, which is amazing technology. We have a computer we can talk to, but that computer takes a while to process data. <laughs> My iPhone could do this information search in like a second. Yeah. <laughs> but Siri still doesn't work that well. You know what I mean? Like, right, 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 right. And now armed with his knowledge, Spock again goes to talk to McCoy. It started on the Earth colony of Tarsus IV when the food supply was attacked by an exotic fungus and largely destroyed. There were over 8,000 colonists and virtually no food. So it was Kodos, the governor of Tarsus IV, who decided only half of the population can be fed. I've heard of it. You may not have heard it all. Kodos began to separate the colonists. Some would live. The remainder would be immediately put to death. He made the decision himself who would live and who would die. Apparently, he had his own theories of eugenics. And McCoy's response is, unfortunately, he wasn't the first. No yeah. way. No way was he the first. That other person that he's referencing directly for the filming of this episode just allegedly perished. Of course, he perished right. 21 years before. Yeah. And that is what brings this episode home, is that there is an even more of a correlation between the theory of eugenics that Kodos had and the theory of eugenics that Hitler had. Well, and one thing just to add to that, you know, Hitler ain't the only guy. I mean, there was a real eugenics movement in the United States long before Hitler. Um, and even in the Supreme Court, you know, there was forced steriliz sterilization in the U.S. And the decision was from a very, very famous chief justice, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. That is the Supreme Court decision that led to the eugenics and forced sterilization of women in the United States in 1927. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the Nuremberg trials, they quoted U.S. Supreme Court quotes about eugenics and said, look, you guys did it too. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, well, you know what? You know what, Steve? Uh, wow. That's that's amazing. The uh, U.S. Supreme Court that the words were thrown back in their face during the Nuremberg yeah. trials. Unfortunately, he wasn't the first. Perhaps not. But he was certainly among the most ruthless to decide arbitrarily who would survive and who would not, using his own personal standards, and then to implement his decision without mercy. Children watching their parents die, whole families destroyed, over 4,000 people. They died quickly, without pain. But they died. The thing that this made me think of, I'm killing half the population to save the other half, is Thanos. Oh. Because that is the snap. And I've heard many, many times people say, you know, Thanos wasn't all that wrong. And I just think that's ridiculous. And you think Jem suspects he's Kodo? And I think Nimoy's performance in this moment is great. He'd better. There were nine eyewitnesses who survived the massacre who had actually seen Kodos with their own eyes. 
Jim Kirk was one of them. With the exception of Riley and Captain Kirk, every other eyewitness is dead. And my library computer shows that wherever they were, on Earth, on a colony, or aboard ship, the Caridian Company of Players was somewhere near when they died. And here is Spock, a logical man, tying it all together, putting the pieces together, and McCoy is going, this is incredible. This is unbelievable. I, I mentioned at the top of our show today that watching the evolution of this episode from what was scripted to what was actually filmed. And there was another scene where production just kind of ran behind and they didn't get around to filming a scene would have given a chilling and haunting feel to the conscience of the king. Now, here we are. We are more than halfway through the second act, Steve, and we still have not officially met Caridian. Right. So it is while Spock and McCoy are talking about what happened on Tarsus IV. And as they are walking, they come across Caridian in the hallway. Oh. And Caridian is wandering the halls because he can't sleep. And he's like a little out of it. He's a little dazed. This is actually when we were, uh, according to earlier versions of the screenplay, supposed to meet Caridian for the first time. And the correlation, the way it leans into Shakespeare, the way it leans into Hamlet, is with the line that we hear Caridian say as Hamlet's ghost, I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain term to walk the night. From Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 5. And here you have Caridian, the ghost of Kodos, doomed for a certain term to walk the night throughout the corridors of the Enterprise. And like when you just sort of hear how the scene was supposed to play out in its finished form, it, it's chilling that this would have been the moment when we actually see Caridian for the first time. But what happened was they had to move things around during the production and they moved the filming of the scene to another day where Stuart Moss, who plays Caridian, had a conflict and couldn't be on the set. So they just huh. got rid of the scene completely. Wow. That would have been really interesting to see that. What would it scary? Hey, rec room, somebody talk to me. We cut to engineering where we see Riley. Riley played by Bruce Hyde. It's his second and last episode of the original series that he was in. And I think people love Riley so much yeah. that they think he was in Star Trek more than he actually was. And for the three days of work that Bruce High did Conscience of the King, can you guess how much he got paid? Guess. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of what I remember. Uh, scale for Scotty, I think you said was like 800 bucks. So I, my guess is three days of work, 275. 650. Uh, okay. But still, 650 bucks. Are you kidding? <laughs> but my guess is, I don't know how, is, the, is he still alive, that actor? Uh, no, I think he passed away recently, a couple years ago. Yeah. My guess is he made good money off of being, be, uh, being Riley of those three days of work for decades after oh, that. Oh, like conventions and stuff, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we're in engineering, and he's the only one in engineering. Jerry Finnerman did a great job lighting engineering. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen engineering look as creepy as it did during this scene in The Conscience of the King. What's up? Not me. I am down in the engineering room. Now you've been a bad boy. Maybe so. Whatever I've done, they're sure keeping it a secret from me. But, and it always bothered me that Kirk used Riley as bait. Well, I always thought I thought he was trying to get him to protect him, to get him somewhere out of the way. That's what I, see, I thought. See, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Like, did he put Riley in engineering to use him as bait to draw out uh, someone in case that someone was trying to kill Riley and Kirk? Or did he put him in engineering to to protect him? Because why would he put him in engineering and no one else is around? Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you're going to use bait, you have to have a a hook, you know, <laughs> like to put bait somewhere where no one is around and you're not watching them. Well, then that's just a sacrificial lamb. I don't think it's bait. 
I think the idea was it's he, he'll be safer. But I also think it doesn't quite make sense for the reason that you just said. Is that a horror plan? What can I do for you, Riley? A song. Yeah, make it a love song. Just something to reassure me I'm not the only living thing left in the universe, huh? Well, you're not. I'll prove it to you. So the song that Michelle Nichols sings for the second time on Star Trek, uh, she is singing the song Beyond Antares. And this is such a, it's, it's a much more beautiful and I would say much more thought out song than what she sang in Charlie X. Yeah. The words were written by Gene Kuhn. Oh, the mu- cool. Yeah, Gene Kuhn wrote the music, uh, wrote, the, wrote the lyrics, and then the music itself was written by Wilbur Hatch, who was Desi Lu's music director. Mm. And Beyond Antares is a beautiful song, and not the only time we would hear Uhura sing this song on Star Trek, because in The Changeling, right before Nomad zaps her, she's on the bridge humming and singing some of the words to Beyond Antares. And that's when Nomad goes up to the bridge and says, what is that? What is music? And he zaps her and wipes her memory. But uh, I think this is a really a beautiful moment, a beautiful scene. I think the director was thinking Hitchcock in this moment because we all know something bad is about to happen and they don't know. And Riley is not aware. And you have that slow build with the distracting music going on, which is a thing that he does in rear window. He does it in dial in for murder. And that's kind of what's happening here. And then we have that hand coming out of nowhere with a pretty normal spray bottle (laughs) (laughs) and squirts Riley's milk. The song concludes And after a moment of hesitation, just completely down that milk, he must have been thirsty. But if it wasn't for for Uhura singing over the intercom, Riley could have died completely. How'd you like that, Riley? Because it's only because the people in the rec room heard Riley choking that, that he was saved in the nick of time. And... You know, for all these years, I I always felt like that maybe Kirk put him there as a way to draw out a potential threat that he could capture, and it just didn't work. I never thought that he was putting him there for protection, because why would he put him there to protect him if no one else was around? And leaving him open and exposed to uh, uh, potentially dying like that. Well, I think you either put this as a criticism of the episode or more depth of character for Kirk, because I don't think Kirk's actions, I don't think he's acting like Kirk. Kirk is decisive and aggressive. He acts. That's what Kirk does. And that's not what he's doing here. I think he is tentative and unsure. Um, And so either that means that this episode isn't quite working or this episode is working really well (laughs) because that's what they want. Well, you know uh, what? Now, now so this is actually a good question to pose to our fans who listen to Enterprise Incidents. So the question is, do you think that Kirk put Riley in engineering to draw out the killer, or did Kirk put Riley in engineering to protect him? So go to our Facebook page, which is Enterprise Incidents, and let us know what you think right there. Leave a comment. Let us know our Facebook page, Enterprise Incidents. Can't wait to hear what people think. I mean, honestly, there are a lot of questions about this episode. The other one is the one we've been discussing all along. How does Kirk really feel about Lenore? That's the other big question. I'd love to hear that on our social media. So that is the end of Act 2. In Act 3, McCoy's doing some tests. He finds out that it's some kind of ship lubricant that Riley was poisoned with. And Spock is saying someone tried to poison him. Tetralubosol is a milky substance. Someone could have gotten careless, made a mistake. I don't believe that, neither do you. I want the captain to see that report. When I finished logging it, now. So this next exchange in Kirk's quarters is drama at its very, very finest. Next to the exchange between Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the sick bay during the episode, The Enemy Within, yeah. this exchange between the three of them is my favorite exchange between them Mm. because of the way that Spock to a lesser extent, McCoy are challenging Kirk on 
all of the actions he has done to this point. I checked with the library computer just as you did. I got the same information. Aren't you getting a little out of line, Mr. Spock? My personal business. It's my personal business when it might interfere with the smooth operation of this ship. You think that happened? It could happen. And and this is the thing. This is where I, I, I'm really with you on that. This is a much more interesting episode than I gave it credit for. He is so resistant. He doesn't want Caridian to be Kodos. He wants it to be done, to be over. And that is why he's resisting so much. And that is why he is so indecisive. And there's this moment where he starts to get mad. I don't like anyone meddling in my private affairs, not even my second in command. That level of anger. uh, This is where I go back to is like, I think that can only come on from trauma. There's no other reasons. Kirk has never, never talked to Spock in this way. Jim, Spock's simply trying. I know what he's trying to do. and I don't like it. It's his job. And you know it. And here's my question about this. Is this why Spock brought McCoy? Because he knew he was going to need backup. And he knew that when that McCoy would do the right thing and back him up when it was necessary. Well, I think that Spock certainly felt like there's uh, something to be said about strength in numbers. And I think he knows, I mean, of course he knows that the two most trusted people on the Enterprise, Captain Kirk, are Spock and McCoy. And if they're both going to him, and they're both trying to reason with him. And you're having a man of logic and a man of, of emotion both appeal to him from, from different points of view, you know, logical and emotional. Kirk would have reason to agree with them and make his decision and deal with it and move on. But I think you're right because of the trauma that Kirk experienced the post-traumatic stress that it probably inflicted on him, the way he is hanging on to try and maybe like, maybe it's all much ado about nothing, so to speak. But <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but also there is just this lingering doubt that maybe it is truly because Kirk feels like I cannot do what you are telling me to do until I know 100% for sure that Caridian is Codus. If it's 99%, there's still a 1% and that is enough to give me reasonable doubt and I cannot move forward with reasonable doubt. And you also know that nothing is proven. Even in this corner of the galaxy, Captain, two plus two equals four. Almost certainly an attempt will be made to kill you. Why do you invite death? I'm not, I'm interested in justice. Are you? Are you sure it's not vengeance? No, I'm not sure. I wish I was. To see Kirk just so conflicted and confused because he cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Caridian is Codus. I've done things I've never done before. I've placed my command in jeopardy. From here on, I've got to determine whether or not Caridian is Codus. And Spock goes, He is. Without any doubt whatsoever. And Kirk says, You sound certain. I wish I could be. Before I accuse a man of that, I've got to be. McCoy said, I love this exchange. McCoy says, What if you decide he is Kodos? What then? Do you play God, carry his head through the corridors in triumph? That won't bring back the dead, Jim. No, but they may rest easier. That's great writing. That is great writing. That is great acting between the three of them. That is just some of the very, very finest acting collectively that the three of them did throughout their their entire time together in Star Trek. I totally agree. And I think Shatner in particular is great because he's playing something that he's playing another side of Kirk that we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. And I think Shatner, who, you know, is known for big acting and certainly in Naked Time and Enemy Within and some other places, we've seen Shatner do big, big acting. And this is the opposite. This (laughs) Mm -hmm. is seeing him do something really subtle. It's later. Spock is still trying to convince him. And then you hear this sound. Listen, do you hear it? That low hum. Phaser. On overload. This is the only true action scene of the movie, and it is a great scene, a well-staged scene, the way that the phaser is slowly building up to the overload, and the music that plays during the scene, Mullendore's score, sounds obviously very urgent, but also it still has this like theatrical sort of old feel to it, a Baroque kind of feel to it. 
and he's like moving his books, he's looking at his drawers, he's flipping over his mattress. And as the sound gets louder and louder, and Kirk is drawn to where the sound is coming from, and he sees that the phaser is in the compartment where the red alert signal is. I thought that was really uh, a great point. Cool. Yeah. It was cool yeah. that you're seeing the, the red alert go off and you're seeing the shadow of the phaser shine through it. And in the nick of time, Kirk opens it, grabs it, goes out into the corridor and, and je- has it jettisoned out into space, literally with just a couple seconds to spare. A couple of decks of the Enterprise would have been blown out. People would have died. Maybe the Enterprise itself would have been completely destroyed. Who knows? But, uh, but it was a, an attempt on Kirk's life. And in earlier versions of the, of the story, there, there was no attempt on Kirk's life. And it was Roddenberry who said you should up the stakes yep. by there being an attempt on Kirk's life. Yeah, that's a great point. Scott, I have a question too. Yeah. Um, is this the only double red alert in the history of Star Trek? Glad, glad you asked, Steve. And yes, this is the one and only time we heard the command double red alert in all of Star Trek. <laughs> so now after 32 minutes of this episode, Way more than halfway through, we are finally going to actually meet Caridian. Another scene of great writing, of great acting. Arnold Moss was 56 years old when he played Caridian. He is a Shakespearean trained stage and theater actor, which I think is quite obvious. Uh, On TV, he had guest starring roles in The Man from Uncle, The Girl from Uncle, Bonanza, and... The monkeys. Nice. I remember his monkeys episode actually, but but the scene between William Shatner and Arnold Moss here, the two of them are just absolutely spectacular, great acting. Now, up to this point, for the first thirty-two minutes of this episode, like I said, we've only heard about Caridian. So in our minds, we've been building it up that when we finally meet who this person really is, that he's going to be this like. You know, mean guy, he's going to be a villain, he's going to be a bad guy. And when we finally, finally meet Caridian, he is a broken man. He is a tired man. He is, he's basically given up on life. Do we suspect that he's Kodos? Absolutely. But instead of being this mean person, he is a frail person. It just creates so much more drama that the person we finally meet is nothing like we thought that person was going to be. I think you feel genuine sympathy for him in this Definitely. scene. And I think the place that he's gotten to, because there's this moment, you know, Kirk is asking him point blank, are you Kodos? And he doesn't deny it. it, it you know, anyone would deny it. If, you know, if someone came to you and said, Scott, are you Hitler? You're like, no. Oh my God. I'd be like, of course <laughs> yeah. not. And, but he says, do you believe that I am? I do. Then I am Kodos. If it pleases you to believe so. I'm an actor. I play many parts. An actor now, but what were you 20 years ago? Younger, Captain. Much younger. So was I. But I remember. And at that point, Kirk tells him to read a speech into the wall, and his voice will be compared to that of Kodos himself. And why they just didn't do a DNA test or pull his fingerprints or his dental records, I don't know, but... I guess the voice recognition just adds more drama to it. But well, I mean, I think the, the, that's why I said the, the whole conceit, this idea that only nine people could in, could identify the governor of a colony of 8,000 people when 4,000 survived, this doesn't really make sense. And that right. in this technological world, we couldn't track Caridian or figure any, it doesn't really make sense, but it doesn't matter that this is what the story is. But does it hold up under scrutiny? No, but you know, sometimes Steve, you just go with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, And he starts reading this speech and halfway through the speech, he lowers his hand with the piece of paper where it's written and Kirk sees it because he has already memorized it. To the more valued members of the colony, therefore I have no alternative but to sentence you to death. Your execution is so ordered, signed Kodos, governor of Tarsus IV. By the way, it's very strange that the speech ends with 
signed Kodos, governor of Tarsus IV. Speeches don't end with the word signed. Only written documents are signed. So that doesn't make any sense either that a speech would have that. But again, it doesn't matter. You hardly glanced at the paper. I learned my parts very quickly. Are you sure? Are you sure you didn't act this role out in front of a captive audience whom you blasted out of existence without mercy? Like like you said, the, like the fact that Caridian is not flat out saying like, are you are you crazy? Like what? Yeah. No, absolutely, positively not. He's not denying it. I mean, he's not, but he's not admitting it either. One is finally grateful for a failing memory. I no longer treasure life, not even my own. I am tired. And the past is a blank. This person that we are seeing, the person that Kirk is seeing, is this broken, tired, sad person. I felt sorry for him. I don't know if Kirk exactly felt sorry for him, but I mean, he's basically seeing all the proof that he really needs right in front of his face. And it's still not enough for him to take the action that he needs to make, just like Hamlet. Literally, at this moment, this is the note I wrote. After the line, the past is a blank, I wrote, Jesus, what more does Kirk need? Again, he is Hamlet. That is my note right there. Did you get everything you wanted, Captain Kirk? If I had gotten everything I wanted, you might not walk out of this room alive. By the way, this made me think of, because there's also this Macbeth theme in this play. And, and it's interesting because to some degree, Kodos is Macbeth, but to some degree, he's actually Lady Macbeth, which I'll, which I'll explain in a minute. But the, this is the line, Macbeth's line that really popped into my head at this moment, which is among his most famous speeches is, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying Nothing. Wow. wow. I think that's where Anton Caridian or Kodos is right now. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. There's a stain of cruelty on your shining armor, Captain. She's been dissecting him in this strange way throughout this whole episode. The lonely part, the powerful part, the poetic part. And she has been elevating him in a lot of ways as the great man. And now... It is the opposite. There is a stain of cruelty on your shining armor. After we have seen Lenore for the first uh, two acts of this episode, in which she was just so lovely, and and the attraction between Lenore and Kirk was so palpable. The chemistry was so passionate. Now she's pissed. You talked of using tools. I was a tool, wasn't I? A tool to use against my father. And the range, the shift in the performance that Barbara Anderson does is just like, wow, what a what an amazing actor she is. Everything that already preceded it was so powerful. And now the power is taken to another level. There, there's two lines I love in this. And, and this is the thing. I mean, we said before in several episodes that Star Trek is very theatrical. Star Trek goes to levels that are somewhat beyond just naturalistic behavior. And in this episode, the language is very theatrical because you have theatrical people. We've already talked about Kirk being poetic. Certainly Kodos is poetic. And so is Lenore. By the way, Lenore, what I first think of Lenore is Lenore is in two Poe poems. And most famous, it is the Raven Nevermore that rhymes with Lenore, mm -hmm. um, the lost Lenore. Everything's always later. Later. Latest. Too late, too late, Captain. You are like your ship, powerful and not human. There is no mercy in you. By the way, mercy is another line that resonates in Shakespeare because of um, Merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. And that comes up many, many times in this episode as well, the word mercy. Kodos used it a little while before. If he is Kodos, and I've shown him more mercy than he deserves. If he isn't, then I will let you off at Benicia and no harm done. And then she calls him out. And as he's walking out of uh, Caridian's quarters, she says, Who are you to say what harm was done? Who do I have to be? The who do I have to be? And what who is to say what harm has been done? I think Kirk has been harmed. That's the whole point. I think Kirk, something happened to him. 
that harmed him, that hurt him really deeply, so deeply that his behavior right now is completely unkirk like And it is that harm. It's the harm that he experiences. The 4,000 people dead is why he says, who do I have to be? He is the person who can be judge at this moment. Right. What about the harm that happened to him 20 years ago? Absolutely. Exactly. Right, right. Hey, you know, this is all in just over the course of, a, of, an, of one episode, of one 50-minute episode, that you've had this relationship building between Kirk and Lenore, and now it's over. Like it is, it is, it is definitely over. So now we're, we head to sick bay where McCoy is recording his medical log and Riley is confined to sick bay as he overhears. Lieutenant Riley sufficiently recovered to be discharged, but captain has ordered him restricted to sick bay to prevent contact with passenger who calls himself Caridian and is suspected of being Kodos, the executioner, and of murdering the lieutenant's family. <laughs> you wanna know what my note was at this moment? I wrote, real smooth, Bones. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are uh, at the beginning of Act Four, and we head to the ship's theater, where the Caridian company of players is about to perform Hamlet for the crew of the Enterprise. Hamlet is a violent play about violent times. When life was cheap and ambition was God. And that is a great way to describe Hamlet. And in Kirk's quarters, they're doing the voice match between Caridian's voice and Kodos's voice. Spock is convinced that it's a match. Kirk still, still has his doubts. We're dealing with a man's life. No machine can make that decision. Like, Kirk, come on. Yeah. Get up with the program. What are you waiting for? What more do you need? It's so close. It's so it's close enough. And this is the point where McCoy realizes Riley is gone, tells the captain they call out security to find Riley. And we also find out that one phaser is missing. So security's out searching the hallway. We're in the play. And of course, it is Hamlet and the ghost. And this is it's some of the things that you talked about before of him saying some of those lines that the ghost is in hell, that the ghost is doomed. And Riley is in the wings of the play. And there is Kirk. Riley, go back to the sick bay. You murdered my father. My mother. He's talking loudly enough that even while the play is being performed, Caridian can hear the words, can hear Riley's voice. I know that voice. That face, I know it. I saw it. And at that moment, Caridian is at... This is the part of the speech of, of the, the ghost of Hamlet's father saying, freeze thy young blood. Now the part, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night. He is the father of Lenore, and he is doomed to repeat his ghosts every time he gets on stage to perform Shakespeare because he is reliving the ghosts of his past. No line from a Shakespeare play is more fitting to the, the character of Caridian than I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain term to walk the night from Hamlet act one scene five. It's so interesting this because it tracks Hamlet and it tracks Macbeth mm -hmm, because we mm -hmm. begin with the murder of, of Duncan and Macbeth is a character that is haunted by his guilt and Macbeth is a character that hears voices and sees visions, you know? And so they're so, they're, they're so tied together. Um, by the way, <laughs> there's no way the audience doesn't see Kirk and Riley. They're yeah, completely the visible. They're <laughs> totally. totally visible. And the scene ends, the actors come backstage and Lenore says, it's going beautifully, what's wrong? And he says, there was a voice out of the past haunting me, torturing me. There was another part I once played. I Long ago, I never told you about it. Now, she just, she was there when Kirk was accusing, she was in the other room. So it seems like she, you know, she kind of does know. But the other thing I was thinking is that this is Macbeth seeing Banquo's ghost, you know, mm -hmm. is that the, the murders of his past have come back to haunt him. By the way, the other thing that's interesting, this is why I say they kind of switch, is that in Macbeth, 
at the beginning, Lady Macbeth is the driving force. She's the one who pushes Macbeth to murder the king. But then as the thing goes on, Lady Macbeth is the one haunted by guilt. She She's the one who says, out, out, damn spot, and is trying to wash the blood from her hands. And Macbeth becomes the violent one. He kills the kids. He kills Banquo. And he's the one who's going to go out and fight Macduff. And so to, in some degree, I think Kodos has become Lady Macbeth and Lenore is Macbeth. That's a that's point. a fair assessment. I'm down with that assessment. So so just as clearly Caridian is thrown and caught way off guard by hearing those words of Riley. And he says, uh, the time has come. The time has come. No, father, the time will never come. Tonight, after my performance, the last two who can harm you will be gone. It is a powerful moment. It is the turning point. It is the uh, the moment where we realize that Lenore has been doing the killing of the people who could have hurt and recognized Caridian as Kodos. And the shock, the shock that his young daughter, who he had been trying to protect, he is so devastated. All seven, more blood on my hands. No, father, not anymore. There's no more blood on your hands. My child, my child. You've left me nothing. So what we are we are seeing play out here in the conscience of the king is a Shakespearean tragedy unto itself. And the sins of the father play out to the daughter. I mean, there's just so many, it works on so many levels. And it's it's so effective. And that's why. I think this is an episode that, depending on how old you were when you saw it, you kind of had to grow into it before you can really appreciate it. The complexity of he's trying to keep her pure from the blood that's on his hands. And yet she, because of her actions, puts more blood on his hands. It's, it increases the guilt while, while she thinks she's protecting him. And the other thing I was thinking, I can only assume that in this production of Hamlet, she's playing Ophelia. There's no other role for her. Uh, yeah, right. You know, right. and Ophelia is someone who dies who goes mad and dies because of Hamlet's pl plot for revenge, you right. know? So that hooks up as well. And, and I, I agree with you, the line of my child, my child, you've left me nothing. And this was a man that was, was already broken. But it was like his daughter was pure. His daughter was untouched by, by what he had done. Yeah. And now she is corrupted just like him. And Lenore sees Cap, you know, Captain Kirk uh, emerge from the wings of the stage and she says, See Caesar come. He's awed by your greatness, your shining brightness. Bright as a blade, before it is stained with blood. Security guard comes over, she grabs the phaser, runs out in front of the stage with all the Enterprise crew members behind her. And she is now crossed over into being a homicidal lunatic. Yeah, she's cuckoo, cuckoo crazy pants at this point. Um, it's a great shot, by the way, when she goes onto the stage with the phaser and she kind of wheels around as the camera is tracking with her. It's a really cool shot. And the next shot of the extreme close-up of her eyes and the eye light, the sparkling eye light. Again, Jerry Finneman did a beautiful job with that shot. And she looks Looney Tunes. I know how to use this, Captain. Caesar, beware the eyes of March. Like all this time, she'd been for referring to him as Caesar. So now you've got that element. Caridian jumps in front of Captain Kirk and she pulls the trigger. No, child, no! And she shoots her father dead. <coughs> like what a tragedy. The scream of devastation. It's such a powerful, gut-wrenching moment. And as Ophelia so to speak, is crouched over the body of her dead father. She recites Hamlet from Act 5, Scene 2. Oh, proud death, what feast is stored in thine eternal cell, that thou such a prince at a shot so bloodily had struck. Barbara Anderson freaking crushed it. She knocked it out of the park, and this is one of her first acting gigs. What a talent. What yeah. an incredible talent. Well, and again, those threads of this is the end of Hamlet and Hamlet is killed by his own revenge. 
So to some degree, she's Hamlet. And of course, Ophelia goes mad. You know, so so all of those parallels are continuing. And it is it, what's interesting, too, by the way, this is the kind of end of a show you would see. It's not Perry Mason exactly, but in an entirely different kind of show. You know, the show with, you know, I don't can't think of big twists like this as a mm. Star Trek thing. I can't think. I mean, certainly there are tragic episodes of Star Trek, but this particular kind is from you would expect in a very, very different kind of show, which I think, you know, something we talked about before, Star Trek is really flexible in the kinds of stories it can tell. <laughs> Just no time to sleep. No place to sing. It will catch the conscience of the king. Can I tell you a quick story? Of course. All right, this is a personal story, but back in 2003, I was covering a press junket for the film Girl with a Pearl Earring hmm. with Colin Firth. So at the end of the conversation, Colin Firth kept saying how he loved the script, how great the script was. So I said to Colin Firth, the play's the thing. So Colin Firth says to me, do you know what he says after that? And I said, "Where and I'll catch the conscience of the king. And Colin Firth goes, oh, well done. And he applauds, nicely done. And all the other publicists in the room applauded. So as I'm walking out, the, one of the publicists says to me, oh, that was really good. How did you know that? And I said, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so great. I mean, I mean, honestly, I think Star Trek inspired a lot of people that wanted to learn a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly inspired me in that way. You know, this is why when we were kids and people who like science fiction and comic books were like, that'll rot your brain. That's just terrible for you. And it's like, no, it is the opposite. The smartest people I knew love science fiction and comic books. And I got to tell you something else. When we get to when we get to the Omega glory, which I know we, we got it was a long ways a away. I have a great story about how Star Trek taught me the constitution of the United States and well, how I put into that into play. That's a great story way down the line. She'll receive the best of care, Jim. She remembers nothing. She even thinks her father's still alive, giving performances before cheering crowds. And then there's a pause and he says, you really cared for her, didn't you? And orders start to go around about leaving orbit and Kirk completely ignores McCoy. You're not gonna answer my question, are you? Ahead, warp factor one, Mr. Leslie. And McCoy says, that's an answer. Okay, so first I want to ask you, what does McCoy think? What does that answer mean to him? That answer means yes, but just like everything else that happened that Kirk did throughout this episode, he kept his cards close to the vest. He kept it close to his vest when he was dealing with Spock and he wasn't confiding to Spock about everything that he should. And now He's basically doing the same by not telling McCoy, honestly, how he felt. But the fact is that Kirk did care about her because even when they're in Caridian's quarters and Lenore basically says, you know, you used me, didn't you? And she go, he said, in the beginning, perhaps, but later I wanted it to be different. He absolutely cared about her. Because even after McCoy says, that's an answer, and he walks away, there's a hold on Captain Kirk's face where his smile fades because he really did care about her. So I think there is a difference between what McCoy thinks, what I thought 20 years ago, and what I think today. So I think McCoy, when he says that's an answer, he goes just like in Naked Time, that doing the job, the enterprise, that's the most important thing for Kirk and that he he's moving past, you know, like he's moving on, you know, whatever feelings you might've had, they're, they're not that important. They're not affecting him. I think that's kind of what I thought 10, 20 years ago. The, not that he didn't care about her, he cared about her, but now he's moving on. But now that we've done what we've done here, and I think about what I'm putting together of the history of who Captain Kirk really is, I think he's a really different guy than I thought he was. All the surface stuff of being the coolest guy in the world, the smartest, the toughest, the hero, the fighter, the you know, all that stuff, totally, totally true. But there was this little blonde that he almost married that Gary Mitchell set him up with. 
And, and you Marcus. just, <laughs> and that might've been Carol Marcus. And, and if it is Carol Marcus, it's like, oh, that was true love. And he chose the enterprise. There is Yeoman Rand, who he has obviously, I think my sense now from what we've done is it wasn't just that he was attracted to her. I think he had serious, serious feelings about her that he has repressed multiple times, particularly in the naked time where he has no beach to walk on. And mm-hmm. then there's the situation with Dr. Noel. And even though his, he was attracted to her, but even though the true romance was put into him by the neural neutralizer, he still had to overcome it and he had to shove it down and shove love away in order to do what he has to do. And I think now that he is completely putting on a front for McCoy, I think he did care about her a lot. And I think this is yet another example of the deep sacrifice and the hidden pain of James T. Kirk that I didn't see before. And we combine that with what we see here that there was some trauma and I suddenly gone, Oh, all of that surface captain Kirk stuff, the hero that I love is totally true. But there's this other truth that I didn't suspect until doing this show with you. Wow. Well, you know, I have, I love that perspective. I love that uh, epiphany and, you know, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And also just that, you know, finding more about Kirk's background and his his history with this this trauma that happened on Tarsus Four, and and the way that it affected his motives and his decisions, and just the whole background and leaning into the Shakespeare of it all. Conscience of the King is a brilliant episode. Uh, the acting is as good as it ever got in Star Trek. It is an episode that is completely timeless because it is based on literature that is timeless. And I'm, I still stand that it is my second favorite episode of Star Trek ever. And looking back on The Conscience of the King, Arnold Moss, who played Kodos, the executioner, said, in a thing like Star Trek, where the whole premise is incredible, you must have something that's believable. And everything there in that episode was quite believable. Gerd Oswald, who directed the episode, said, Leonard Nimoy was the greatest. He's absolutely fantastic. Arnold Moss was excellent. Everybody was fine, except Shatner, who I couldn't communicate with. Those who come premeditated like Bill Shatner, there's just no way you can direct them. Now, Barbara Anderson, who played Lenore Caridian, by, by contrast, said Bill Shatner was really great and made it fun. He would break character and use the humor as a release. He was a pleasure. So that's what some of the people who worked on the show thought about Conscience of the King. But what do you think? Well, here's some of the comments we got on our Facebook page. Martha Hoffman Caresti says, while it's not a happy episode, it's a thought provoking one. She says the mystery and suspense make the whole plot riveting. On the other hand, Glenn Helwig says he doesn't care for it. It's like a Shakespearean play with some sci-fi thrown in. It's not what he expects from Trek. Tim Callender has always liked the episode, and one of his favorite things is that the plot is not trying to figure out the Caridian is Kodos. He really feels the tension in Kirk's dilemma. He wants answers, but is kind of afraid of what that might reveal, and this causes him to make some questionable decisions. John Francisco writes, One thing that never bothered me as a child in the 70s, but as a father of a college-age daughter some 35 years later, is that Kirk is 34 and Lenore is 19. And we just had an episode where he uses his charms on a teenager to get what he wants. And here we are revisiting that same theme again. For a character that is otherwise a paragon of virtue, John Francisco writes that it's a disturbing flaw. Michael Okuda writes, The Music. Gorgeous, lush, poignant score by Mullendore. I couldn't agree more. Tom Phillips says, it was a rather dreary episode to me as a kid, but when I rewatched it last winter, I was completely held by it. And since I primarily remember Barbara Anderson as that dull actress from Ironside, it was a revelation to see how beautiful and sensual she was here. Well, these are fantastic comments. We read everything you put up on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram, and we can't wait to hear your comments on our next episode. Um, and I have one more little thing to add to this, which is Kodos is used in one of my favorite TV shows ever. 
And that Simpsons? is on The Simpsons. The yeah. aliens are Kodos and Kang. Kodos the Executioner and Kang from Day of the Dove. Oh, I amazing. just love that piece of trivia. I think that's awesome. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I, 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 as much as I have always felt like I love this episode, it was such a, a pleasure, a pleasure to do a deep dive into an episode that absolutely deserves a deep dive, The Conscience of the King. How, how uh, do, do you feel about this episode now that we've, uh, we've done our deep dive? So it's not going to go up on one of my favorites lists, but more than any other episode we have done so far, my view of this episode has been completely transformed because I really dismissed it. It's not that I didn't like it. I just didn't ever think about it. It would never went on any lists I thought about on Star Trek. And now I'm going, if we accept that what is happening is real, then it's teaching me all these things and it has a depth that I just never really considered before. So I'm really glad. I'm glad that I knew ahead of time it was one of your favorites. And I'm really, really loved having this conversation with you. Well, make sure you head over to our Facebook page and let us know what you thought of our deep dive episode into the conscience of the king. And uh, make sure you uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mans. People, where, uh, uh, Steve, where can people follow you? They can follow me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. They can follow Enterprise Incidents on Twitter at Enter Incidents on Instagram at Enterprise Incidents. You could subscribe to the show at all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher. But here's what we're going to do next week. We've gotten some amazing reviews from you on Apple Podcasts, and we are going to start reading some of them because there have been fantastic comments that we'd love to share. So if you want to hear your comments on the show read on a future episode of Enterprise Incidents, leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts. We also know that it is the reviews on Apple Podcasts, on Apple iTunes that help us get charted so more people find out about Enterprise Incidents. And we absolutely would love it if you shared Enterprise Incidents with people you know, whether they love Star Trek or that there's casual fans. Just please do get the word out so uh, people find out more about us. And if you enjoyed watching something that had a lot to do with theater, well, on The Cinephiles, we've done a few great films that were based on plays, including Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, my favorite play of all time, Amadeus, and possibly the greatest film ever made that was based on a play, and that is Casablanca, which was based on the play Everybody Comes to Rick's. That's on The Cinephiles. And next episode, we're going to get into uh, back to epic status with the Galileo 7, which is Spock's first command. That is next time on Enterprise Incidents. And until then, keep going boldly. Keep going boldly.